Well, hello and welcome back. We're going to take a look at our last video lesson in our lipids chapter, phospholipids and a cellular membrane. And then you'll begin kind of completing some of those thoughts in terms of health and medicine in a reading guide to complete your notepad for submission. So the title of our sixth section, phospholipids. And I have to say that there is a lot of review, perhaps from your biology days, high school biology, and perhaps even if you've gotten into a little physiology in at the college level, or if it's still upcoming, you'll have some review, I promise. Look at this root word here called phospholipids. Kind of taking those two root words apart, we can see that the element phosphorus must be involved with this fatty molecule we're learning are called lipids. So yes, indeed, phospholipids are lipids that contain the phosphorus atom. There's two common types of phospholipids, and we'll kind of study those one at a time. They are called phosphoacylglycerols, phosphoacyl, that's the ester bond, and glycerol, the glycerol backbone, out again to play. And then a little different molecule called a sphingomyelin, sphingomyelin, and I think always a neuron, uh, especially like a neuron sheath for myelin. Our general structure for a phosphoacyl glycerol Again, we're gonna just take a quick peek at drawing these general structures. We're gonna put a, a kind of a um, vertical glycerol molecule straight up and down, but we know specifically by now that a glycerol is a three carbon chain, and what we'll see here is an ester linkage. Two of the three bonds, two of these three bonds are identical to triacylglycerols. They, that contain fatty acids from our section two. That very chart that I gave you in, in the front of your notepad page. But what makes them unique is this third attachment, which we see a phosphate. If you remember a phosphate from inorganic, phosphate is a polyatomic ion that has a central phosphorus and four attached oxygens going around in all directions. There's a formal charge on the phosphorus of a minus three. And actually we'll start to see that there'll be some double bonds leading to those oxygens. And then that phosphate is leading out to an alcohol, an OH group. So what makes a phosphoacylglycerol molecule different from the fatty acids we were studying before is this third attachment involving the phosphate linkage. Now compare that to a sphingomyelin, and we see that no longer do we have glycerol as the backbone, but we have a separate, kind of a different backbone. Well, there's some similarities when we look at its carbon structure, but a sphingomyelin replaces glycerol and puts fin sphingosine into its place. We still have one fatty acid, and then notice this is the same, a phosphate alcohol group. So one of the fatty acids has been replaced as terms of the tail part of the, the actual structural backbone, leaving just one fatty acid to attach. And again, identical phosphate alcohol in that third bonding position. So if we compare a triacylglycerol from what we were just drawing, to a phosphoaglycerol molecule, we can see that the difference is in this third attachment where we have a phosphate, a PO4, that's a marker, we have a phosphate, PO4 minus three, giving us that structural phosphorus grouped here, phosphorus in the central region, and of course leading out to an alcohol. And we'll develop some of those very specific structures, but Sorry, just comparing triacylglycerols to a phosphoacylglycerol, it's that third attachment that makes them different. They are the major component of most cell membranes, and that's probably where we've heard them most often. A phosphoacylglycerol are the main components of most cell membranes. So structurally, they do resemble the triaglycerol, but instead now we have a foster diester bonded to the alcohol. Phospho 
Di ester. Phospho is the PO4 we talked about. And notice now there has been an ester linkage, but instead of going to a carbon, it's replaced by the element phosphorus. Diester means there's two ester linkages, and there are indeed two ester linkages, but the linkage attaches to a phosphorus instead of a carbon as it would in a fatty acid. One of the main types of phosphoglycerols, phosphoacylglycerols, is cephalin or it gives us a long name based on its chemical structure. We see the root word phosph, a tidy, ethylene ol for the alcohol and amine for the nitrogen. We'll call it cephalin. When I look at this particular structure, I can see that this is a phosphoacylglycerol, so we have the glycerol backbone. There's the original glycerol that was the three carbon chain. Glycerol has those three alcohol units. In place, in I'll call this position one, we have an ester linkage leading to a fatty acid. And in position two, we still have that ester linkage leading to a fatty acid. And now in cephalin, here is the new portion compared to the triacylglycerol from before. Carbon number three leads to a phosphate, a PO4 unit. And so the phosphorus leading up to a double bonded oxygen. Two of the oxygens are bonded in a linkage. And the negative charge on this oxygen is critically important because it's there to electrically balance the positive charge on the amine group. So emphasize as you're drawing this that I see a negative charge on the oxygen and we're balancing that negative with a positive formal charge on the amine group. So here we have a new word, ethanol amine, ethanol amine. The ethanol is a two carbon alcohol group, carbon one, Carbon two, a two carbon alcohol group. The term amine is the nitrogen, and we just finished a chapter devoted to the amine chemistry. And notice based on formal charge, since it has a attachment, it's four bonded, so we can think of that as four bonds, and we would have a plus sign there. So an ethanol, that's the alcohol part, Amine is based in nitrogen, so it's just a derivative of that alcohol portion. So cephalin, in that third position, we have a phosphate ether, ether linkage, sorry, there's the two ether linkage, and then it leads to a two carbon ethanol amine group. Another type of phosphoacylglycerol is called lecithin, lecithin. And again, it also has a long chemical name based on what its structure is, a phosphatidy. And then again, notice we have the phosphate group. And then we see this part here saying it's atidyl choline. Choline is this part of our molecule from the alcohol. We're stressing a lecithin product will have the phosphate and instead of a mono-substituted nitrogen, we have a tri-substituted nitrogen, all with methyl groups, and it's a four attachment. I'm gonna go back a slide to emphasize. Notice here, the nitrogen all led to hydrogens. It was simply a mono-substituted amine where the nitrogen attached directly to the alcohol. In our next type of phosphoacylglycerol, in this last portion, we have a tri-substituted nitrogen in which all directions lead to another methyl group. Lecithin is a second category, a second main type of a phosphoacylglycerol.
These two fatty acid chains are very non-polar tails and they lie parallel to each other. And that phosphodiester end of the molecule is charged with the polar head. I'm going to back up and say this region, but we have these very long fatty acids. Those long fatty acids are a non-polar chain. They are what we refer to as hydrophobic water hating. But here we have a very charged area. We see that that oxygen is carrying a negative charge. The nitrogen is carrying a positive charge. And that creates what we have as a polar region of the molecule. And because it's polar, it is said to be hydrophilic, water-loving. And that general structure there has a polar head, which is the charged positive and negative region of that phosphodiester region. And those two tails represent those two fatty acid chains, those long carbon chains that were hydrophobic. Water loving is the phosphodiester region, polar head. Water hating is the fatty acid chains, the nonpolar tails. Very important structure really in the structure of a membrane as we'll soon see. So here we have a molecule, a phosphoacylglycerol, and we can see that it's a very complex structure, but I can see some similarities. Notice here, right off the bat, I wanna point out, here's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three of the glycerol backbone. So I can still see the same backbone as the glycerol molecule. And in position number one, I'll call this position one, I have a long carbon fatty acid chain. I also have that in position two. So when I label this as carbon two, I can see a second long carbon fatty acid chain. These are referred to as the tails and they are hydrophobic water hating because they are indeed long carbon chains, non-polar. Down here, I can begin to see the phosphate group. Remember these phospholipid bilayers, phosphoacylglycerols contain a phosphate attached to the nitrogen and that nitrogen are very charged particles. We have a negatively charged oxygen here, balancing the positive charge on the nitrogen. And this creates what we have as a polar region. We call this the head of the molecule, and it is indeed hydrophilic, water-loving. To generally draw that structure very quickly, you'll see just this type of picture where we have a polar head. This polar head represents this region of the molecule. We have these nonpolar tails. These nonpolar tails represent these long carbon chains of the fatty acids. So polar heads and nonpolar tails is a quick, dirty picture there, just a quick structural area to let us know that the head of a phosphoacylglycerol is very polar coming from the phosphate group, and the tails are nonpolar coming from the fatty acid group. Well, let's practice. Draw a phospholipid that fits each of the descriptions in the following. We want a cephalin formed from two molecules of palmitoleic acid. So I'm gonna suggest you find your chart because we're gonna need to know palm it oleic acid, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we can work to the next one. So find that and look up for me the formula of palmitoleic acid and then just pause the video and come back once you've found it.
Are you ready? Pausing the video helps, doesn't it? So welcome back. I know that you went to the trouble to find this particular fatty acid. And so <clears throat> what we want to do is begin simply by drawing the glycerol backbone and knowing that the glycerol backbone still is going to contain the ester linkages. The uh, palmitic acid is, we just saw, we can write this as CO, and I'll just leave this as OH because it will be in the acid form, even though we'll hook it as an ester linkage in a moment. We had CH2 taken seven times. We had a CH double bonded to the next CH. We had CH2 taken five more times, and then finally the methyl group terminating the carbon chain. So that's why I paused and let you do that hard work of finding that from your very front page of the note pack. It's a tool page. You don't have to know these by heart, but you do have to know how to find them. So I know that in the first two positions, first two carbons are going to attach to the fatty acid. So that's the general structure of our phospholipid. So I know that this particular O is going to, to create an ester linkage, and I'm just now going to attach the rest of that fatty acid. So this is the carbon that I just drew here. I have a CH2 group taken seven times. Then I bump into that C double bond C, then I know that it's a cis conformation. We have a unit of CH2 taken five more times and then terminating with the alkyl methyl group. We have two identical fatty acids, so I just need to draw this twice. There we have it. So position one and two are indeed the positions of the two fatty acids. We looked up palmit oleic acid. And then, of course, to make it a cephalin, we know that it now has a phosphodiester linkage. So the P replaces the carbon. And down below here, I'm running out of room, so I'm just going to come to the bottom. I know that that oxygen is charged with a negative charge. The oxygen pointing up is a double bond, just as it is above, except the oxygen now is attaching to phosphorus. We had a diester linkage. We made sure to place the bottom oxygen as a negative charge because we understand it's going to balance the nitrogen that is all four bonds and H3+. Now remember, we have to remember cephalin, that cephalin molecule, just so we can see. I have to kind of go back up. Remember how we emphasized cephalin? had just the three hydrogens attached to the nitrogen. And to just emphasize the difference on the next page, we compared that to lecithin, which had all methyl groups around the nitrogen. Since this question asked us to draw a cephalin, we knew that it had nitrogens here at the terminal end to all hydrogens. This next question asks us to draw a phosphatidylcholine from two molecules of lauric acid. Well, where did we see that word a moment ago? That choline molecule, if you recall, was this particular molecule right here, how we just emphasized a lecithin is coming from a choline, and that's a tri-substituted methyl group on the nitrogen. So that's where I'm pulling this next example from so we can see a model. We always start with our glycerin backbone, CH3. We will have ester linkages going in all directions. Now lauric acid, again, take a moment if you need to because we have to look up. I don't know it by heart, maybe with enough repetition you could, but there's a chart on the front of your note pack for lauric acid. And we can see that it is a carbonyl carbon. It's the acid, so we'll leave the OH there, even though when I come down to attach it, it will form an ester linkage. And this was a straight chain. So we had CH2 taken 10 times leading to the terminal methyl group. So this is the lauric acid. How did you know that? 
Well, it's in your table on the front of your notepad page. So that means right here, I can just complete the two fatty acid tails by drawing in the carbonyl, that's this guy here, we had CH2 taken 10 times, terminating with the methyl group. That's a 12 carbon chain. Position two will be identical. So I'll just repeat the second carbon, the two fatty acid tails. And that was the same as up here. These were called the tails, the non-polar region that is hydrophobic. And this, of course, was known as the head of that molecule, the polar region of the molecule. So now that we know we're coming from a choline, a phosphatidylcholine, we're gonna just follow that same example, but at the end, we have all methyl groups attached to the nitrogen. Instead of, I'm gonna make that O negative, uh, we lead to CH2 taken twice, I'll just jot them out, CH2, CH2. And now at the end, the nitrogen has all methyl groups surrounding it in all directions. So it's N with a plus sign because it's four valent, four bonded. CH3 taken three times. And this is what we would refer to as the head or the polar region of the molecule. We mentioned there was a second category of phospholipids, a sphingomyelin. Sphingomyelins do not contain a glycerol backbone, but instead their backbone is called phingocene, a phingocene backbone instead. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 carbons in the sphingosine molecule. Sphingosine, that is the backbone. And notice the difference here is that in this section, this is a long carbon tail all by itself and does not need a fatty acid to create a second tail. So just part of the molecule itself really contains a fatty acid -esque structure, doesn't it? Uh, it's not truly a fatty acid because it never leads to an OH uh, uh, from a carbonyl, but it certainly is a non-polar tail. That leaves a site of attachment then for two other functional groups. So when we think about that structural formula as a a sphingosine, that, that molecule itself, gives itself the first of the three tails all by itself. So here we have a molecule for a general structure. We had the fatty acid, and then this was just like the previous. We have a phosphate attached to an alcohol, but the backbone is different. Instead of glycerol, we have sphingosine. Now, let's take a peek at some, some uh, you know, more focused here. We have carbon one, two, and at carbon two, it leads to that nitrogen group. Let me back up and show you where that came from. See this nitrogen group? That actually is resulting in the next tail. So here, that nitrogen group serves as a sort of attachment. This is what we called an amide. Again, the functional group <laughs> that's not right. The functional group or the carbonyl leads to a nitrogen. That's what's happening here. That's what's known as the amide functional group. And then, of course, we had the hydroxyl group. Remember, that's still sticking out here. So it's still kind of represented out here, the OH. And then the long carbon chain, this here is that long nonpolar tail. So we still have a phosphodiester linkage. The carbon leads to an oxygen, and instead of a carbonyl, it now leads to the phosphorus. This is known really as the myelin sheath. It's, it's the coating that surrounds nerve cells, and very rich in sphingomyelins. That's a coating on the nerve cell to help the axons uh, 
uh, conduct electrical current quite quickly down a long axon and dendrite. So if we just kind of take a peek, it's a basic cell here, a nerve cell from biology. This is known as a neuron. And the neuron, of course, is responsible for creating electrical impulses um, that will stimulate an action where the fiber ends. A myelin sheath surrounds the nerve cell and insulates that. And that insulation then says, as the electrical impulse originates from the nerve cell, it is allowed to just jump from axon to axon there. And this coating here, which is a rich fat molecule, kind of insulates interior and helps conduct uh, you know, a faster current by allowing it to jump from node to node. So again, here is an example of a sphingomyelin molecule. The sphingo, this is the tail here. This is the whole backbone molecule here. And notice that it contains a nitrogen group and the hydroxyl group is all part of the original backbone, the original backbone we called from the sphingomyelin. Alrighty, so that backbone itself, just trying to say some words here, sphingosine, sphingosine, that's this particular backbone. Part of that structure included an amino group and a hydroxyl group. We have the charged particles here of the oxide negative when the nitrogen positive, just based on formal charge, and long polar tails or long nonpolar tails as part of the compound. And this makes a nice reference. You might even want to pause the video here and just add these bullet points to your notes. I want you to compare and contrast the picture of a triacylglycerol the triacylglycerol that had the glycerol backbone, which is the three carbon unit. And all three of the attachments were just fatty acid chains, triacylglycerol, three ester linkages leading to three fatty acids. You then compared that to phosphoacylglycerol. Phosphoacylglycerol still contained the same backbone, carbon one, two, three, that's the glycerol backbone, and still identical is two of the three fatty acid chains, and what's unique is the phosphate linkage, the diester phospholinkage, leading out to a nitrogen group. And then finally, the third molecule had a completely different backbone, the sphingomyelin has two nonpolar side chains and one ionic head, and that molecule is called phingosine. This molecule represents the backbone, and we saw as part of it we had a hydroxyl group and the amine group. This part leads out identical. Let, let's make sure we can see that. I'll use uh, bright yellow. These two are identical to these structures. It's the backbone that's different and this difference here from the nitrogen in position two. Add those bullets and it helps to emphasize the structures as we're working to memorize. Let's identify the components of each lipid and classify it as a triacylglycerol, a phosphoacylglycerol, as, or as a sphingomyelin. Classify any phosphoacylglycerols as cephalin or lecithin. All right, so let's start by finding the backbone. All right, so I have carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, leading to ester linkages. So this I recognize as a glycerol backbone. I then recognize the long carbon fatty acid chains so I have two fatty acid chains. And now, if this last linkage were the same, I'd have a triaglycerol, but they're not. I have, going out here, I'm leading to a phosphate group. And very critical is that the phosphate group has all hydrogens. And when that's the case, we understand that it will now be categorized as a phospho acyl glycerol and specifically what type 
is the cephalin because they had all nitrogens leading out to the hyd all hydrogens leading out from the nitrogens. Let's peek at letter B. Letter B, I can recognize a glycerol backbone, a three carbon chain. The first carbon chain comes all from fatty acid. The second is a fatty acid and the third is a fatty acid. All three are fatty acid chains. And I know that because their parents here are all carboxylic acids. The word acid, carboxylic acid, and the long carbon chain are fatty acids. So a glycerol with three fatty acids, we've learned, is called a triacyl glycerol. And how about this last one? We have something way different going on in the backbone. With the backbone, I notice that I have a hydroxyl group off one end, I have a nitrogen group coming in the center, and that with this particular molecule, this whole entire structure serves as the backbone. I have a amine group coming off of position two, and I have a phosphate linkage coming off of carbon three. This is what we've learned to call a sphingomyelin. Practice recognizing the structural groups on a phospholipid. And this leads to a very important application of phospholipid chemistry in, a hum in an, any living organism because it's the basic uh, surrounding the membrane of a cell. We understand that the cell plays a vital role in creating an internal environment from the external environment. And that cell membrane surrounds the cytoplasm. And I remember even in biology days of high school, oftentimes students would just be asked to draw a cell membrane or even a cell itself and make, you know, label it out. So we're just reminding ourselves that a cell membrane has been called a phospholipid bilayer and it serves as a barrier to keep certain ions out and certain molecules in. Semi-permeable. Sometimes we hear it called selectively permeable. It's the job of the membrane to allow nutrients in and wastes out selectively based on the polarity of the substance. So those phospholipids with their hydrophilic polar head and two hydrophobic nonpolar tails. That's this general structure we saw before. We had the head, which is water loving, and we had the tail, which is water hating, a phospholipid. And we call it a bilayer because we can start layering these one on top of the other to keep the polar heads on the outside so as I draw this structure, if the polar heads are facing to the outside environment, what it will do is be allowed to interact with the water on the external part of the cell. Simply because these are polar or water loving and therefore they have an interaction that's favorable. The nonpolar tails are to the inside to avoid, because they hate water, right? The nonpolar tails avoid the water by pointing inside. And here's the structure far better than the one that I just drew. Here is the head, the phosphate ion. Here is the tail, those long carbon um, fatty acid chains, and that general structure, the heads and the tails. And we call this a phospholipid bilayer where the heads point out and the tails point in. Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Oftentimes we see things embedded in the cell membranes to ease transport across the cell membrane. Some of the things you see might be a carbohydrate. You might see an integral protein an integral protein goes all the way through the entire membrane. 
or a peripheral protein, which just is embedded at the surface. You could see a cholesterol molecule embedded in there to give it rigidity. And you see hydrophobic tails, hydrophilic heads, all part of a cell membrane, the selectively permeable membrane that allows certain substances in while keeping others out. Those proteins and cholesterol molecules, well, they're embedded in that phospholipid bilayer membrane, as pointed out. We said that peripheral proteins were embedded just on one side. Integral proteins extend the entire way through the phospholipid bilayer. And sometimes you'll even find carbohydrates that are attached to the exterior of the cell, glycolipids and glycoproteins. Upcoming chapters, of course, we'll talk further about carbohydrates and proteins and amino acids and so forth. So we're just saying the words to help ease into that next topic on proteins. A cell membrane from one source contains phospholipids formed from linoleic acid and oleic acid. A cell membrane from a second source contains phospholipids from stearic acid and palmitic acid. How do these two cell membranes differ? Pull out your chart, the very front cover, and find for me the formulas for linoleic and oleic acids. Let's do the same from stearic and palmitic. I want you to decide which ones are saturated and which ones are unsaturated as you kind of tackle that problem. And I don't want to just give the answer without some think time, but I'm hopeful that you'll find the answer as you think deeper into what type of structures you're looking at. What do linoleic and oleic acid have in common? What do stearic and palmitic acids have in common? And I'll pull out my, my fatty acid chart and we'll kind of look at that together. See if I can find one. Did you find yours yet? <laughs> Mine is not close, darn it. Well, ha, Eureka. Maybe I beat you, maybe you beat me. I see that uh, stearic acid here is CH3, CH2, and that's taken six times, COOH, and palmitic acid is the one right above it. This is CH3, CH2 taken 14, I think that's a 16, my bad, 14, and that's COOH. But I wanted us to notice that these are saturated fatty acids. That's the key in recognizing their commonality is that these are all single bonds. And what similarity did you notice with lino linoleic acid and oleic acid? Well, linoleic acid, as we look on this chart, this had CH3, CH2 taken four times, CH, and then we start to see some double bonds, and there's quite a few double bonds, and I'm just going to quit writing there because I, we just recognized the commonality. You, you looked at that and said these were unsaturated fatty acids, and that's key because unsaturated with those cis double bonds make them liquids at room temperature, and saturated fats are solids at room temperature, so as I interpret this question, it's really asking me, what difference does it mean if the phospholipids are liquids at room temperature or if they're solids at room temperature? How might these two cell membranes differ? And that kind of eased into the answer a little bit, didn't it? So I would expect membrane A with these unsaturated fatty acids to be more liquid, more fluid 
More pliable might be another good word. Since they are contained with fatty acids that are unsaturated, whereas compound cell B, which their fatty acids are saturated, coming from uh, very tightly packed, more rigid, The rigid part I'm just kind of emphasizing because we know that it would come from a solid instead. So more rigid. I think I ran out of room. That's why it keeps jumping there. I'll write rigid underneath. So in the presence of our unsaturated fatty acids, we have a very fluid, a very liquid and pliable cell membrane. Whereas if the cell membrane is made of phospholipids with fatty acids that are saturated, it's a much more compact more tightly produced packing and then rigidity. And that makes sense just based on the structure of the fatty acids contained in there. And of course we know that uh, transport across the cell, and this is again a little uh, review from your biologies, the small molecules can diffuse right through based on what we call diffusion. Diffusion is defined as motion of a molecule from higher to lower concentration, so just based on a concentration gradient. The larger polar molecules need to be facilitated to transport, and that's the job of that facilitated protein, active transport. Ions can travel through the integral protein channels based on charges. And some of them have to move against the energy gradient, you know, from low to high concentration. And that's um, not the natural state of diffusion. So from low to high must cost the cell energy to do that. And that's why it's known as active transport. And I think a nice visual of all of those vocabulary words is simply placed right here. The cell membrane. If it diffuses directly through, simple diffusion based on a concentration gradient. If it's allowed to go through a transport channel based on the gradient, we called it facilitated transport. If it's being pumped out of the cell against the concentration gradient, it costs the cell energy and it will be called active transport. And that's why we see the energy being input. Recognize the phospholipid bilayer, the heads pointing out, and the tails pointing in. Great work with our talk today about phospholipids. The rest of your chapter is now assigned as a reading exercise. In your section eight, if you'll allow me to just preview, section eight, you're going to focus on health and medicine, specifically the cholesterol molecule you'll see that steroids are a group of lipids whose carbon skeletons have several fused rings and you'll be asked to draw out the steroid skeleton and you'll be asked to number the skeleton. Now it is fine with me if you draw this once and just number the same structure, that's fine. I give you two boxes, you decide. But you'll investigate steroids in their fused rings. You'll then turn your attention to cholesterol, which is the most prominent steroid. We talked a little bit about cholesterol and cardiovascular health in a previous lesson. Synthesized in the liver and it's found in almost all body tissues. And we get that from many dietary sources, uh, mostly from animal products, meat, cheese, butter, eggs, not so much in the plant. And then in your ninth reading section, your section nine is on steroid hormones and you'll go through and, and kind of compare what a hormone is as a molecule that's synthesized in one part of the organism, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have an effect in the immediate area. It actually el elicits a response at a different site. So a hormone is a traveling messenger. You'll look at the chemical uh, compositions of a few hormones, such as the sex hormones and adrenal cortical uh, steroids as well. And you'll look at the sex hormones of estrogen and progesterones in females and androgens in the male. And you'll fill in that reading packet. You'll focus on fat soluble vitamins and learn that vitamins are organic compounds. Uh, they come in two categories, water soluble or fat soluble. And we'll need to have those recorded as the fat soluble. So they're stored in your adipose tissue and not just flushed out 
any excess amount gets stored, unlike water-soluble vitamins, which flush out any extra amount. So you'll read about how they store in fat cells and complete that section of your reading guide. And then finally, the last focus on health, will look at prostaglandins and leukotrienes. Leukotrienes and prostaglandins, trying to say those words so you can hear them in your head. Prostaglandins and leukotrienes, you can hear the three double bonds with that word, triene. There are two types of this chemical family called eicosanoids and read a little bit about how they're synthesized and how they're called local mediators. And friends, when your entire packet is completed, you will submit your completed note pack into the Dropbox in this module 19. I look forward to receiving your work soon.